technological quantum computation. And uh, we must also have a direct link to Berkeley because he got his PhD at Berkeley with the mesh, right? When was that? 2011? 2015, probably. 2000. Oh, no, no, no. It was, yeah, <laughs> ele uh, actually, I'm not sure, but um, 11 or 12, I think. 11 or 12. Yeah. And uh, so then, Some time he was, ago. then he was a postdoc at MIT, where I was fortunate to, to spend time there with him. Okay. And now uh, he's a professor at Caltech, as I said, and uh, he's done uh, fabulous work in quantum. I don't understand it all, but, you know, but uh, randomness certification, verification of quantum computing. And today he's going to talk about uh, the honor. So, really, thank you. Masami is a great speaker, so this is a major treat. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Jeffy, for the um, very generous introduction. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's a pleasure to talk in front of you. Uh, this is not my typical audience. I think I know um, as few people in the audience as I, as I you know, ever, have ever known, known when giving a talk. So feel free to uh, interrupt me if you have questions. So this is going to be a talk in, in two parts. Uh, the first part is going to be pretty high level. I just want to give you sort of an introduction as to uh, where, is quantum, uh, where is the field of quantum computing these days. So that's for those of you who are not familiar with the area. And then the second part of the talk, I'll get a little bit more technical and talk about the, the title, um, which is give you an interactive proof system uh, for quantum computations that has the, the zero knowledge property. Uh, so let me start by, by general things. So um, the field of quantum computing was born uh, in the early 80s based on two major discoveries. Uh, so the, the first major discovery was the, is the fact that um, by encoding classical information into quantum degrees of freedoms of physical systems, you can achieve communication, secure communications with um, levels of security that do not have any classical equivalent. So this is called, sometimes slightly abusively called uh, unconditional security, but a security based on physical principles instead of on uh, computational assumptions. So that's a uh, quantum key distribution. Um, and then the, the, the second major discovery is, is, is the realization that by building machines based on the principles uh, that perform computations based on the principles of quantum mechanics, then you could solve certain computational problems, um, such as factoring, for example, much faster than we know how to do uh, using classical computers only. And not only this, but then um, also this hypothetical quantum computing machine could, in principle, be built um, fault tolerantly. So in a way that the whole theory of uh, error correction for quantum machines that guarantees that um, you know, we, um, these algorithms would be robust to imperfections in the device. But that was all in the 80s or, or 90s, and at the time, all of these were um, highly theoretical results. Uh, so that's one of the first experiments uh, for, for QKD. So it's uh, you know, over 30 centimeters, and it's uh, absurdly noisy and absurdly slow. Uh, but you, you, you could do experiments um, already in the 90s, uh, just sending one photon at a time. Uh, in terms of computers, this we definitely didn't have. So that's the best, uh, the best quantum computers that you had in the, in the 90s. So it was all very hypothetical. Um, so this is this what changed. I think uh, everyone in quantum computing has the feeling that over the past um, three years, four years, we've been witnessing a very fast uh, phase transition. And so we're enter entering a, sort of a second era of quantum computing. It's, a, it's an era that my uh, colleague, John Preskill uh, at Caltech, um, has, has coined a very popular acronym for. So the acronym is, is NISQ. It stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. Um, so this is an era in which uh, we have these kinds of devices that's uh, announced, not yet demonstrated, by Google, where um, so there's a quantum computing chip that has uh, 72 qubits. And the uh, feature that all these devices uh, share is that um, they're not fault tolerant. So this is not a full-blown quantum computer. It's, it's very small. It only has 72 qubits. Yet uh, it's large enough that it's, in principle, able to perform computations that we don't know how to simulate directly. So this is an ongoing race for demonstrating a quantum advantage, building a machine such as this one that has the ability maybe not to factor, because that would require a much larger computer, but to solve some computational problem or some sampling problem um, that we don't know how to solve on the, on the classical computer. There's also been a huge amount of progress in quantum communication. It's not something I'm going to talk about too much in the talk, but just to, to flash a picture, this is a, a, a satellite built by the Chinese government uh, and I think one or two years ago, they demonstrated quantum key distribution over huge distances, so between Vienna and, and some, some city in, in China. So qu quantum communications is a, is a fairly mature field. Uh, quantum computing is, is not, because we're still at the stage where, where we have these kinds of devices. When you say key distribution with privacy, yeah, with secure key distribution. Well, yeah, OK, yes, yes. Um, I mean, I'm not going to go into key distribution, so I, I didn't want to say too much about it. Um, 
the question that I want to uh, focus on for the talk is um, what are going to be the modes of interaction between sort of the end user, um, so that's you or me with our laptop, and these uh, potentially much more powerful quantum devices. Um, so it's an interesting question uh, how you can manage to test and verify and control and interact securely with this kind of a machine that is in principle much more powerful than you are um, and also that you don't understand so well. You can't perform a direct simulation of it, um, et cetera. So I'm going to talk about that question on a um, sort of fairly theoretical level, uh, but I want to emphasize that it's, it's also a very concrete question. This is almost a techno tech <laughs> technological problem. Uh, so there's a number of companies, such as uh, IBM, for example, that are already putting their quantum computers on the cloud. Um, so I'll, I'll actually give you a small demo of this in, in a minute. So IBM has a, has a number of quantum computers that you can um, run simulations, on, not simulations, that you can directly compute with uh, through their website. Rigetti is another um, is a startup that's that's based in the Bay Area that also has a quantum computer that's available through um, a range of APIs that you can um, uh, sign up for on their website. Uh, Google is uh, promising that once they finalize this chip that I showed you on the previous slide, um, something similar will happen. So you'll be able to play yourself with the um, with the with the chip. So let me give you a, a, a small demo just to show you uh, how this works. I mean I. Um, so I am going to take the simplest example of an interesting quantum computation. Um, so here's a quantum circuit. Uh, so if you've never seen a quantum circuit before, it's the same as a classical circuit. Um, it operates on qubits, which is the quantum analog of a bit. And then there's a number of gates, and then it ends with a measurement. So that circuit just has a single qubit, has a single gate, and it has a measurement. But that gate is chosen so that the quantum mechanics predicts that the outcome of the circuit should be a bit uh, that's perfectly random, 0 or 1 with power d 50, 50. That's the circuit. Physically, if you want to think about it, it's very simple. Um, what you do is you basically just have a mirror, uh, and you beam a laser at that mirror. And the mirror has the property that is going to split the photons that hit it 50-50, uh, depending on their polarization. And so if you tune your laser so that it sends just one photon uh, at a time, the photon is going to hit the mirror, and then it's going to go straight or be deviated with power D 50%. This is something that, that, that is realized, um, and people build uh, random number generators um, based on this. This is a picture of my random number generator. I didn't bring it here. It's at, it's at home, but you can, uh, you can buy it. This is uh, constructed by a Swiss company called uh, ID Quantique. Um, and so that's one of the you know, simplest, uh, yet um, impossible to achieve classically, um, demonstrations of uh, quantum advantage. So you can generate perfectly random uh, numbers. OK, so now let's try to use one of these cloud computers in order to do that. So I, I could sort of do it live, but you, you never know when the thing is going to be down. So although it's, it's generally pretty reliable. So you can log in, uh, create a free account at uh, ibmquantumexperience.com, something like this. You can look it up. So it, it, it looks like this. Uh, and then there's a nice little interface. So that's their computer. Um, it has five qubits, and uh, the links are which ones are connected to each other. So you can't do any two qubit gate you want, like only the ones on the links. And these are um, fidelities of so just some statistics. But you have this nice interface where you can just plot your circuit. Um, so, so I plotted my circuit there. That's my uh, Hadamard gate. So that's the, the mirror. Um, and that's the measurement. And then I'll click um, you know, Run. Um, and then like a, a few seconds later, IBM gets back to me and says, yeah, well, we ran your circuit, and here are the results. So we ran it a few times, and we got 0 with uh, probably the 0 0.502, or 0 0.502 fraction of the time, the number of times we ran it, and 1 uh, with probably the 0.498. Um, so it works. Um, Sorry, Thomas, can I ask Yeah. So now there's discussion of quantum advantage. Are you comparing with the best known classical, or is there, are you comparing against lower bounds for classical? So the question is, um, when we talk about quantum advantage, what are we comparing uh, with? And so either the best that is currently known to be achievable classically, so that would be, for example, um, let's say factoring, where I would say there's a quantum advantage, um, or are there explicit lower bounds, uh, maybe based on uh, some conjectures or in some, some uh, complexity theoretic assumptions, because you um, I'd have to at least separate BPP from BQP. So if I don't do that, then there's not going to be any advantage. I mean, the other problem is that we're talking about 50 bits, right? So it's very hard to get a concrete number. Right. Number as, right. Um, yeah. um, so generally, it's um, I, I guess it depends what you want. But if you want a concrete demonstration, then this will be against uh, the best known classical lower bound. And people have these races um, where um, there's a, a quantum problem that's demonstrated. You can do it with 50 qubits or 60 qubits, and then the question is, well, 
you know, the, the classical runtime is going to be 2 to the 50 or 2 to the 60, but then what's the constant in the exponent? Can you improve it? Uh, but also, where's the lower bound coming from? Just strong classical lower bound. Oh, well, in that case, I wasn't doing about, talking about lower bound. I was just saying about the best, uh, the best achievable. So if there's lower bounds, then you, may, you need to make assumptions. And if you want concrete lower bounds, then you may need to make concrete assumptions. For example, the assumption, yeah, you need to make concrete assumptions as to like a specific problem not being, you could take factoring, for example, and make the assumption that it can't be solved in, in plot time. So you need to say, you need to have put something explicit, right? So, so you, need, you need to do that in general. Although for other problems like this, um, this is a little bit different, right? Because that's not computationally difficult. Um, it's impossible, uh, classically, to generate a random number. And my quantum computer can do it. Look, the statistics are very cool. Uh, so that's a quantum advantage. The question is whether we believe these statistics, right? I mean, how did IBM come up with these numbers? Did they just do it the way I would do it, which is like take a piece of paper, do a calculation, and say, well, it's supposed to be 50-50. If I tell my user that it's exactly 50-50, it's going to look suspicious, so let's wiggle a little bit, and then, and then just say it, right? Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, so just to um, you know, summarize what's going, been going on here is that the way we think about it, this is, this is me with my laptop. It's the entity that we call verifier in, in interactive proofs in general interacting with the IBM quantum computer and I have this circuit that I'm interested in and I'll uh, give a description of the circuit to the IBM quantum computer and the IBM computer is going to um, return to me an answer. So it, it'll tell me, oh, it got zero and then I run it another time, it'll say it got one and then I run it multiple times and then I can reconstruct the statistics that I had on the, on the previous slides. And so um, once you've set it up in this way, then there's a number of questions that you need to ask, right? Um, the first question would be, okay, well, I mean, is this outcome that I'm observing uh, correct or not? So in the case of a simple circuit like this, um, I can check. I can, I can, I can do the, uh, myself, estimate what the distribution should be and uh, check it against the distribution that's reported by IBM. But that's because this is a pretty simple, uh, small computer and my circuit was very simple. So I can just do the computation by hand. Now if I uh, take a little bit of a, a slightly larger computer that IBM is also offering in the cloud, I can also still simulate that using my um, calculator. So that's pretty easy. If we take a slightly larger computer, I think this one, that's a computer that was announced. So people, in quantum computing, people announce lots of stuff, and then it's like sort of not clear whether it happens. So this one was announced at CES, like January, not this January, just January before. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from Intel here, but I don't, I don't know of anything that happened to it. So but anyways, so if you manage to do this and then you compute what is the amount of uh, space that you need in order just to represent the state of such a machine, um, then you get something like 70 terabytes, okay? So you can still simulate these machines on the, on the best uh, supercomputers that exist today. Now if we go to the chip that's promised by Google, 72 qubits, and if you do the computation, um, interestingly, you get uh, 600 hexabytes, um, and so that's just about the size of Google data centers worldwide, or that's sort of like a rough estimate. So Google can still simulate, uh, in principle, their chip, but they're probably the only ones. Um, and if you make it just a little bit bigger, then no one will be able to simulate it uh, anymore. Right? So the question is, well, can you devise protocols such as, even though you can't simulate this process uh, directly yourself, are there ways that you could verify that the outcome is, is correct? Yeah. Could you test it with other smaller quantum computers? I mean, that's a question uh, that you can ask. So, um, yeah. I mean, I guess that's the question that I'm asking here. I mean, it's not, it's, I, I have four questions. I won't directly focus on that question, but there's a lot of research in, in, in yeah. doing similar things. Yeah. Actually, I'll, I'll say something about this. A bit. <coughs> yeah. Can you comment on the P wave? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm not an expert on D-Wave machines, so it's not. I don't have anything interesting to say about it. Huh? This is recorded. Right? Let's talk later. Okay, so no questions? Okay, so that's one question, right? Um, and what makes it difficult is this sort of exponential scaling. But this is the reason that we're interested in these computers in the first place, right? That they achieve, uh, in principle, things that we couldn't achieve classically. But another question, slightly more subtle question, is, well, uh, maybe I'm interested in not only if the outcome is correct or not, but was it obtained correctly or not? And that's a question that's relevant for the randomness. 50-50 is correct, um, but in order to certify that the outcome that I get is random, that, that's not a property of the outcome itself. It's a property of the process that generated the, the outcome. Right? There's a little cartoon here, I don't know if you can read it, that, that sort of makes this um, very vivid. Um, what they're saying is that, look, I mean, if you're supposed to be generating random numbers and IBM reports that they got 9999999, then on what basis are you going to complain um, about that number, right? This is, it, is, it is a number that has you know, whatever probability of, of, of achieving. It's perfectly legal. Um, okay, so that's the, the, the verification questions. And then we have the um, security or, or privacy questions. 
Um, one question would be, well, is there a way to delegate this computation that I'm interested in uh, to the computer in a way that um, preserves uh, the, the privacy, my privacy of the computation, so that hides the computation that I'm interested in? So this would be an analog of uh, homomorphic computation, for example. <coughs> and then there's the flip question, uh, which is the sort of the zero knowledge question, which is, is it possible to implement protocols that, 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 that achieve this um, kind of verified uh, delegation of computation in a way that uh, they have the zero knowledge property. So in a way that uh, Google is able to just uh, convince me that they're reporting the correct outcome of the computation without leaking any information about how they achieved uh, uh, or how they arrived at that outcome. So just to be a little bit more formal, so we're going to be thinking about these kinds of uh, interactive protocols between a classical being and a quantum computer where the classical uh, entity is interested in determining what is the outcome of a certain quantum computation that they have in mind represented by a, by a circuit. Um, and so here are the um, list of properties that we'd like. I mean, the most important one maybe is the, is the soundness, which is that at the end of the interaction, it should be the case that uh, as long as the verifier accepts, then the outcome of the computation that it records is the correct outcome. So there's no way for this machine to convince the verifier of a wrong outcome, even though it's, it's, it's more powerful than the verifier itself. A slightly more subtle would be convincing the verifier that the outcome has the right distribution or has been obtained in the, in the correct way, whatever, whatever that means. And then there's the uh, uh, privacy guarantees. So the first one that I mentioned earlier is, is generally referred to as blindness. So this would be uh, designing such a protocol in a way that the verifier does not give any information to the, the prover, to the quantum computer, about the computation that it's uh, desiring it to compute. And then the other one that we'll uh, focus on in the talk is the zero knowledge property, which would guarantee that the verifier does not learn anything about the computation other than the outcome uh, itself. But the function, with knowledge of a function or not? What do you mean by with knowledge of a function? So a computation, so you want to compute f of x. Right. When you say blindness means you don't even know what f is. Exactly. The verifier does, right, of course, yes. but the prover would not know what f is. And in zero knowledge, um, does it assume that the performer of the computation knows it? Um, well, you could try to have both properties simultaneously. And so in that case, um, we have both blindness and zero knowledge. So, okay, because so they would not know. I have not defined what? So there is a third bullet, which is no. blind at zero knowledge. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, we, we could do that. So right now, they're independent properties. So they confuse me, too. So okay. you, could, you could be, to me, they seem not, that each one should hold on its own. It's kind of a they're bizarre situation where I want F to be performed. You don't even know what F is, but I also am not supposed to know anything about what you did. So having both, I don't understand the application, but I understand each one separately. Uh, no, I mean, in zero knowledge, it's more that, uh, in, so in zero knowledge, you think of the verifier as being dishonest. So no, it would I, be, you know, know, yeah, 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 but, but, I, but <laughs> no, but okay. What I want. But what I'm saying is the idea of blindness. Is the verifier is requesting a computation, right? So yeah. The has no idea what he's requesting, but he's yes. still going to perform it. Right. And in addition, and now you want to put a constraint at the same time on the verifier that he won't know how that computation was performed. Hmm. And everyone, okay, each one is separate. But I, okay, it's not. Maybe I miss. Formulated that zero knowledge is not really that you don't want to learn how the computation was performed, but it's that you don't want for it to be feasible for the verifier to learn something more than the outcome of but that the particular problem, computation. But, you but you're saying, quantify, given that the, the right, I understand. function is uh, known, or given not, or is the pair XF of it is the only input? Um, yeah, that's right. So, um, what do I mean? I think I want to think of them as being separate, yeah. uh, two separate properties. And I want to talk in you as about zero knowledge, not about blindness. Um, <coughs> well, it's not a third bullet, well, it's a third bullet, but it's irrelevant. I mean, uh, the reason that bullet is there is just to say, well, what, what's interesting about, specifically more about zero knowledge anyways in the quantum setting is that for those of you who are familiar with uh, zero knowledge proofs, they often involve uh, the use of simulators and in particular a proof technique that's uh, called rewinding. So you execute the protocol in a certain way and then you say, well, you know, let's pause, let's rewind uh, the actions of this device and let's ask it another question and see what it would have answered uh, to that other question. And in this way, you manage to construct your simulators. So that's the point that's particularly tricky uh, in the case where the device is quantum because we cannot rewind uh, these quantum devices in general. So um, spe especially when the interaction is classical, so the device is going to perform um, measurements in order to determine the outcomes that are sent back to the verifier and these 
measurements are um, uh, non-reversible. Um, so we will have developed a whole set of techniques uh, to deal with this difficulty of uh, making rewinding arguments go through in the, in the quantum case. So let me just uh, say a little bit about the, um, kind of give you a flavor of the kind of uh, protocols that have been built in order to solve this problem of uh, verifiable delegation of quantum computation. So this slide is not about blindness or zero knowledge, it's just about uh, achieving softness. And you have to think that our starting point um, would be the situation where the verifier itself has a quantum computer that it trusts because it's its own. And so in that case, it would be able to run the whole computation by itself and there would be no problem at all. Right? And so what we're trying is to design protocols that off offload as much possible as the quantum computation to the cloud. Um, so there's been a lot of work uh, on that question. And in general, it's a very challenging question. So some of the first works are due to um, Aronov and co-author and then the um, other is uh, Broadband, Fitzsimmons, and Kashefi, um, where um, they design protocols that have the following flavor. So the verifier still has a very small quantum computer, but the only thing that's required of this computer is the ability to prepare uh, one quantum state at a time, one qubit at a time, and then send it over to the prover. Um, and then the verifier does this, it sends all these states to the prover, then the prover makes the computation um, based on these states, and then the verification happens through classical communication. So the effort of the verifier is mostly classical, except for this uh, preparation of, uh, of quantum states. Then there's kind of a, a dual uh, family of protocols that was, that was pioneered by Morimai and Fitzsimmons, um, where now the prover does the whole quantum computation themselves, but they're going to send one qubit at a time to the verifier, who's going to measure these qubits as soon as it receives them, and then based on the outcomes that are obtained, perform a classical computation, so there's no classical interaction there, and then determine uh, what is the outcome of the, uh, of the computation. Okay, so these two um, uh, types of protocols involve a little bit of quantum ability for the verifier and some quantum computation. And so for a fairly long time, it was a big uh, open question whether you could design protocols that have only classical communication. Um, so the first type of such protocol uh, is due to Reichard, Reichard Unger, Vazirani, 2012. And they showed that if you uh, assume that you have access, you are able to query two quantum servers that are in isolated locations, yet share something known as quantum entanglement, then you can have uh, protocols for delegated computation that are information theoretically sound and only require the exchange of uh, classical information. There's a drawback to that, which is that you need to have these two servers that need to be in, in isolated locations, so how do you guarantee this? Um, but again, for a long amount of time, this, this is the best that was known. And just last year, um, Mahadev, who was a PhD student here, introduced uh, the first protocol for the delegation problem in which the verifier is entirely uh, classical and there's a single uh, quantum uh, prover that's, uh, that's, that's required. Um, the protocol has a little bit of a different flavor than the other protocols. I'll get to it a little bit later um, in the talk. It doesn't work directly in sort of the most intuitive way in the circuit model where you'd direct this prover to um, perform certain gates one at a time. It sort of takes a, a more global approach where you're going to require the prover to prepare a certain quantum state uh, that contains in it the, um, that certifies that the outcome of the computation is a certain thing. And then the prover is going to uh, reveal information about that state classically in a way that allows you to verify the existence of the state and as a corollary, the fact that the computation had a, a certain outcome that the, that the prover is trying to consider. What does it actually require to measure a qubit? Um, it depends what that qubit you're asking physically, or it depends what that qubit is made of. I mean, you can think of, uh, if you think of a protocol with communication, then um, usually photons would be used. So you can think of this quantum computer as a, a solid state kind of computer. I mean, it's a big, it's a big thing in a, in, in a fridge. Um, but then it, it has the ability to beam uh, photons, like just, just like using a laser or something, to the verifier. And the verifier just needs a mirror um, to just like measure where the photon arrives. And that, that's, that's what it required. So these, these measurement devices are, um, this is very easy to make. Um, the, the one, the picture that I showed earlier contains one. You can, you can buy such things. The quantum communication, I mean, you need a quantum communication link. And uh, so experiments have been uh, done for uh, demonstrating these kinds of protocols on very small machine, of course. So it's, it's, it's definitely a technological challenge, but it's not a huge in principle. Uh, challenge. Another question. So those first two boots, we had the verifier time as long as the computation. Yeah. But the last one doesn't. 
The, the last one, you mean prover? this one here? Yeah, because the prover uh, sends you something that's uh, based on the entire computation, right? Not yes, but the, but the size of that thing is, is, has, the size, <laughs> has the size, the number of gates in the computation. Oh, I see. So, so, so it still means that to read it, you need to take as much time as the length of the computation. All these protocols, the verifier has runtime that's generally even polynomial, maybe quadratic or cubic in the number of gates of the computation. Uh -huh. um, the difference is that it's classical runtime, of course, not quantum. Or, or the other ones, they only have a few qubits rather than many. Got Right, although the number of, same thing, the number of qubits that you need to process in these protocols is proportional to the number of gates in the it's circuit. It's one at a time? But it's one at a time, oh. yeah. You can just get it, measure it, then keep classical information, get it, measure it, keep classical, and then do a large classical. Uh, so people haven't really investigated uh, the option of having, you know, sublinear, um, uh, super efficient or verifier, or even polylogarithmic uh, verifiers. Or even n squared versus n, you know. <coughs> yeah, that's also true. Yeah. So one one reason is that the these three protocols uh, involve no computational assumptions at all, and so achieving these kinds of efficiency gains, if you don't make computational assumptions, that I don't think um, the, last one does. the last one does. And so in that case, you're saying, well, you know, if I if I do make computational assumptions, then why don't I make my verifier even more efficient? Right? I think this is sort of work to be done still. Um, so as, as we mentioned, the, the last protocol, which is the one that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, um, does make computational assumption. Of course, you want your computational assumption to be a post-quantum computational assumption. And so concretely, uh, the assumption that's made for that work is that the learning of errors problem is, uh, is, is post-quantum secure. So that's, that's a problem in, uh, in lattice cryptography. Maybe Daniele will mention it later. Um, an advantage of the protocol that's going to be relevant when we start talking about zero knowledge is that uh, it allows verification not only of uh, uh, quantum computation, efficient quantum circuits, but also problems that are in quantum NP. So that's the class that's called QMA. I'll define this a little bit uh, later, where you're trying to verify the existence of a certain quantum state. And as long as the prover has uh, sufficiently many copies of that quantum witness, then it can demonstrate to you that, that it does have. So some of these protocols have the blindness property, not all. I think the first and the third have the blindness property. Um, none of them has a zero knowledge uh, property. So this is something that had not been studied <coughs> so much before. And so it's, it's one I want to talk about for the, for the second part of the talk. So if there's questions about this, now I'm going to go into just like concrete protocols. Okay. And I'll try to stay fairly high level and understandable for those of you who don't have the background in quantum computation, but let, let's see if we manage. Um, so so I, Alessandro already gave a, a very nice introduction to what it means uh, to have for a protocol to have the zero knowledge protocol. He didn't give you an example, and so I'm going to give you an example. I know this is bread and butter for a lot of people here. It's but it's going <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So GMW. Um, okay. Um, Godvars Mikali and. Uh, Okay, well, um, and Vigderson, uh, okay, okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, okay, I'm going to give it to you because it's, I mean, if you've never seen it, it's nice, um, and also because then we're going to try to build on it to make it into a protocol for testing uh, language that's in quantum, uh, quantum version of NP instead of just the classical version of NP, which is the, the, the three coloring problem. So our input here is a graph, for example, this very simple uh, graph. And what we're trying to determine is whether the graph is, is three colorable, where um, a three coloring of the graph is just an assignment of colors to all the vertices. You have at most three colors, such that each edge uh, has endpoints of, of different colors. So how do you do that? It goes in, in three phases. Uh, at the first phase, the prover is going to determine a valid three coloring and then send to the verifier a commitment to that coloring. So commitments already arose in um, Alessandro's talk. You can just think of it as a, as a big uh, safe that's placed around uh, the color and that is sent to the verifier. And this safe needs to have, or this commitment scheme needs to have two properties that it's uh, hiding and binding. And we're gonna see how they're, how they're used. Uh, so then at the second step, the verifier is going to challenge the prover to open two of these commitments. So it's gonna select an edge at random, for example, this edge there, and ask for the prover to provide keys that open these two safes. And the, the prover is gonna oblige, uh, reveal the keys that open the commitments, the verifier is going to uh, open the commitment and check that it sees uh, two distinct colors along the edge. So why is this protocol sound? Meaning that the prover would never be able to convince the verifier that the graph is three colorable when it's not. Um, this relies on the binding property of the commitments, which is that when the verifier receives these uh, n safes, as many safes as there are vertices in the graph, 
then uh, in principle, these saves uh, hide certain colors that it cannot see. That's the hiding property, but these colors are there, are fixed. And in particular, if the colors um, do not correctly color at least one of the edges, then there's always a small chance that the verifier would choose that edge and challenge the prover for the edge. And then the prover would get caught. Um, and then, um, so that's for the soundness property. I mean, if you want, this gives you a low soundness. If you want to get a better soundness, you'd repeat the protocol multiple times. And now the zero knowledge property, this is interesting uh, because there's two ingredients that go into it. The first is that at the time where you receive all the commitments, then that's the hiding property of the commitments. You have these big safes and they reveal no information at all about the coloring. Okay. But later you are asking about some information. What you're saying is that, well, please, don't, please open this edge and show me these two colors. So you are learning what are the colors of the endpoints of that edge in a three coloring of the graph. So now the key observation is that this three coloring problem has a very nice structural uh, feature, which is that if you have a three coloring, you can take any uh, random permutation of this three coloring, it's still a valid three coloring. And if you choose the permutation at random, the colors of just one specific edge, these are going to be uniformly distributed over all the three possible valid colorings of that edge. So if the prover does this, if instead of committing to a specific coloring, it commits to a random permutation of a specific coloring, then when the verifier opens the edge, it doesn't learn anything about the original coloring that the prover has in mind. And so this is a perfectly zero knowledge uh, protocol. Oh, this is a zero knowledge protocol, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so now we want to try to do the same thing in the quantum case. And so before doing that, I have to tell you a little bit about the kind of problems that we're going to be able to try to, uh, that we're going to try to verify in a zero knowledge way. So that's uh, the class uh, QMA, it's the quantum version of NP, it was introduced in the, in the late 90s um, by Kitaev. So let, let's first just like remind ourselves what NP is. So um, uh, in NP, the, the setup is like this. So you're given as input a formula. Uh, think of this formula as a set of constraints. So these phi j's are constraints. And then the formula is just that the and of the constraints should be satisfied. Okay, so for example, for my three coloring problem, each of these is the constraint that a particular edge should be colored using different colors. And then my general formula is just that all the edges uh, should be colored correctly. And so our goal in three coloring is to decide whether there is an assignment of the var to the variables that completely satisfies the formula. Um, and more generally, the, the max case that problem is uh, trying to find an assignment to the variables that satisfies the largest possible number of uh, constraints. Okay, so let's talk about the, the quantum version now. So if you think about these formulas as putting constraints on the physical system, the physical system are the variables, the constraints are um, that these variables should, should, should have colors that, that satisfy certain constraints. So in the quantum case, we're going to represent that by Hamiltonian. So Hamiltonian is a word uh, that's used by physicists to denote um, the way they, the mathematical object that they use in order to represent physical constraints that are imposed on the certain uh, physical system. Like for example, the magnetic field and nearest neighbor interactions and these kinds of things. For us, it's just, it's just a matrix. Think of this as a matrix um, that says what are the constraints on the system. So just to do it pictorially, um, in my three coloring example, I had a state space. The state space was you know, three colors for the first vertex, three possible colors for the second vertex, three possible colors for the third vertex. And uh, my problem, my formula imposes constraints on that state space, right? It says that, okay, these two should take different values and that would be a constraint. The quantum case is exactly the same thing, um, except that you make things um, continuous. So instead of having a state space that's discrete and has three possible values, I'd have a state space that's uh, it's a vector space uh, C3 and uh, that has dimension three. And instead of taking the, the, um, my total state space, instead of being the cross product, would be the tensor product. And it's not really important if you don't get the, the math about this, because I'm, I'm going to stay uh, fairly informal about it. And the Hamiltonian just puts constraints on the state space. So it says that, well, um, you know, this, the, the part of your um, system that's in, in that space should, should satisfy certain constraints. You can think of this, if you want to think about the math, you can think of this as a projection operator. Um, that is assigning a penalty of one to states that you don't like and a penalty of zero to states that you do like. If this projection operator is diagonal in the computational basis, then you recover classical um, constraint satisfaction problems. So these are a strict generalization of classical constraint satisfaction problems. And so our goal, uh, given the input, is to determine uh, what is the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix. Like in physics language, we call it the smallest energy um, of the system. So we're trying to determine whether um, this matrix has an eigenstate um, that has low enough overlap. So that corresponds to a small eigenvalue, or at least so that the, the overlap there is small. What makes the problem difficult is that in general, if you've paid a little bit of attention, this matrix 
is a matrix that acts on the space that has a dimension, in this case, 3 to the n, so it's an exponentially large matrix. So in principle, you can solve this eigenvalue problem in exponential time. Um, and the point is that if you have a quantum computer, given uh, this eigenstate that minimizes the energy, then you can perform measurements on it that correspond to this Hamiltonian and will tell you or allow you to estimate what is the, the energy that it has. So, yeah. Where does the K come from? Or where you oh, yeah, K would be the number. Yeah, so I haven't really said that. So um, this H needs to be, you need to be able to specify these constraints um, efficiently. So it can't just be any odd uh, exponential size matrix. So I'm assuming that he has, has a decomposition as a sum of local constraints, kind of in the, in the classical case. And then this local constraint acts on a certain subset of the particles in my system. And K is the number of, uh, so K would be two in that, in that, in that example. But um, I don't think we need to be too formal about this, right? The picture that I wanted to give is just the picture that um, what we're trying to determine now is, is very much uh, analogous to what we were trying to determine in the case of three coloring. Does there exist an assignment to the colors that, uh, to, the var to the vertices that satisfies the, the constraints? Except here that the assignment is a quantum state and the constraints are, are, are quantum constraints. So let's go back to our protocol from the previous slide and just make everything quantum and see if this works or not. Um, so it almost works. Um, so that's the problem that we're trying to decide. Um, the prover is going to come up uh, with this quantum state, which is the, the best quantum assignment to the, the, the quantum constraint satisfaction problem. And so we're again going to have a, a protocol that goes in three phases. Uh, so the first phase, the, uh, we want the prover to send a commitment. It has to be a quantum commitment now. Uh, so we can do these quantum commitments. Um, if you're curious, the way to do about it, the way to do it is to encrypt the quantum state uh, using the quantum version of the one-time pad. Uh, so that uh, results in a quantum state of the same size. And the quantum one-time pad uses a key, um, just like the classical one-time pad. It's a classical key, except it has twice the length um, because you're encoding the quantum information. So what the prover would do is that it would encrypt each of these uh, qubits there using the quantum one-time pad and also send a classical commitment to the classical strings that are used to encrypt the quantum state okay. and ship all that to the verifier. So that's, that's quantum communication. Uh, and then the verifier would say, well, okay, let me choose one of my constraints at random, for example, this one, and let me ask you to open the commitment. Uh, so the prover would return to you uh, the encryption keys. Uh, the verifier would check that they uh, match the commitment, would use them to decrypt the state, would perform the measurement, and would check that it satisfies the constraint the way it should, um, it should satisfy the constraint. Okay, so this protocol is sound. That's fine. Um, the commitment that I have there, I'm not, I'm not cheating about it. It, it, it is, it is uh, binding. Um, it is also hiding, so this protocol has soundness, and let's talk about zero knowledge now. So the original commitment that's sent, that also reveals no information. The quantum one-time pad is, perfectly hides uh, the quantum information, so there's no problem there. The problem is um, about this last trick that we used in the GMW protocol, uh, the randomization of the colors, right? So in this protocol, the verifier still gets to do two things. One, it gets to choose what edge it opens, what constraints it looks at. And second, it gets to choose how it looks at it, right? Because the prover opened the commitment. Now I see the state in clear. Uh, in principle, I should be making a certain measurement. That's the measurement that's encoded in Hamiltonian. But in practice, the verifier can do something else. It can do another measurement. And maybe that measurement is going to reveal uh, more information about the quantum state. So we don't have, uh, in the quantum case, such a nice uh, problem as the three-coloring problem, where I could just say, well, let's just like randomize the state um, and be done. Um, so that makes the question a little bit more interesting. And so now I want to. Tell you, um, so, so you're saying the verifier can choose his measurement depending on what he saw in the previous uh, uh, random choice for the color? So there was some random choice for the colors in some sense. Yeah. Uh, you mean the prover's choice or? Yeah, the prover said. It well, was the prover, red and no, green. so. Okay. Uh, uh, you open and it turned out it was red and green. And the next time. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. so, so are you saying that the problem is that the verifier, when he measures the next step, no? It's not, I mean, that would be a problem, but it's, that's not even a problem. The problem is even more basic, is that there's no, this randomization that could be done in the coloring problem cannot be done here. So even just in the one-shot case, mm -hmm. uh, I could make a measurement that uh, reveals more information about the state. In a way, I'm going to not only learn that the constraint is satisfied, but it can be satisfied in many different ways, just, just like in three coloring, and I'm going to learn the specific way in which it's satisfied. And that's revealing some information, unless I do a similar randomization trick. Um, that is not something that we know how to do uh, for the quantum states. So it's not going to be one out of six. It would be, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, okay. 
So, it, do you believe that we don't have, are there other languages out there that might support some randomization? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, like, could we formulate a property and maybe study the class of languages that have this property and maybe if they, it's not empty then it, something weird happens or? So you, you're going to see how I get around this in the next slide and it could be that um, based on that you could devise such a language, I'm not sure. So I don't think that question has been asked. Much. I think it's an interesting question if you're interested in zero language. Sorry, Paul. So uh, I, I see two problems. Are, uh, one is that the commitment should itself be quantum proof here, otherwise... Uh, well, at this point, I'm interested even in a, in a quantum zero knowledge proof. <laughs> well, right at the end, we'll, or depending on time, maybe not, but we'd make the proof classical. But you're, you're, you're right. I mean, it's something that maybe I wanted to be, the interaction to be classical. But for now, let's be satisfied with a quantum interaction. OK, but, but the, the commitment should be quantum resilient to begin with. Otherwise, the prover could... Uh, uh, yes. yes. The second thing... Uh, is to say, I think to say that there is not analog on of the permutation, but in the classical setting, there were two arguments. First, by permuting things, once you reveal them, then I get you know, the same distribution of colors, no matter what the underlying was. That is one. But there is another thing, that the act of permuting itself, I can do at home, and you never know what I've done. So here, even if there is a physical analog to permute it, so that once you reveal it, it can be, it could be that the act of permuting, if it exists, it could be leaked and measured by me if I am now not only classical but also quantum. There is some leakage, a soup top, right? Well, right, so we definitely want to prevent that, yes. So we'd want to prevent it that. Um, that you leak information even to a quantum malicious verifier. For sure, yes, yes. Yeah. So we're going to achieve So you have two problems. A, the permutation doesn't exist that preserves the local everything, and two, if it exists, it should also be the case that there is no quantum leaving. So it's both completeness and soundness that have to be. Focus. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So, okay. Yeah. 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 Well, let's see how we do it or how, I, um, how it can be done in the next slide, and then we can, you can ask your question again if it's not satisfied very well. So this is a protocol that's due to uh, broadband, g Watches uh, 2016, and so we're going to, um, thank you, uh, we're going to take the, uh, attempt from the previous slide and sort of fix it in order that it um, recovers the zero knowledge property. And there's going to be two changes. Um, the most important one is that we're going to change the way this commitment uh, works by adding a layer of uh, authentication. So instead of just encrypting the state, I'm going to also authenticate it um, using separate key for the authentication and then both all keys are classical and then commit to the uh, commit to these classical keys. So this authentication is going to uh, require a couple of properties that we're going to see what they are as we go through the, the protocol. Okay, so I'm making a slight modification to the way the commitment procedure is, is, is performed. So in this way. Okay, so then um, we had like the easiest problem to deal with that we had before is that uh, the verifier has the option of choosing which term it wants to verify. And that's already giving it a little bit too much prover power to a dishonest verifier compared to a honest verifier. So we're throwing in um, a coin flipping protocol here that's a classical protocol between the verifier and the prover just to ensure that the verifier chooses the term that it requires, uh, that it requests uh, an opening for uniformly at random. That, that, that's pretty straightforward. We do that, so the prover and the verifier jointly select the term to be opened. And then the prover is not going to give any information about commitment at this point. The verifier is going to directly perform the measurement on the authenticated encryption of the state. So here you need a special property, which is that this authenticated encryption, even though it does not reveal any information about the um, underlying state, it allows you to do what uh, we call a transversal <coughs> measurement, which is that you can perform, if you're interested in a specific measurement, measuring this specific term, you can perform a uh, derived measurement directly on top of the authenticated encryption, such that if you have the outcomes of the measurement and you have the keys, then you can decode back to the actual measurement outcome that you were interested in. So the verifier just measures directly on top of the authenticated encryption, on top of the commitment, if you want. And then it's going to obtain outcomes and then just return the outcomes uh, to the prover. And then at this point, uh, the prover has the outcomes that the verifier obtained. And it also has uh, the keys um, that are, it, 
it is attached to by the commitment. And so it's going to engage in a classical zero knowledge proof that is going to demonstrate to the uh, verifier that it holds keys uh, such that these keys match the commitment. And furthermore, if you decode the verifier's outcomes under the keys, then you obtain outcomes on the original state that satisfy the, that satisfy the, quantum, uh, the quantum constraint. So that's it. That's the end of the protocol. The soundness uh, relies now on two things. First of all, uh, the binding property of the commitment as before. And second, now we also need this zero knowledge protocol to be sound and to be sound against uh, quantum adversaries. So we need such a protocol. And for the zero knowledge property, then uh, we have the two ingredients that I introduced. So one is the, uh, will be the soundness of the coin flipping protocol. And second is the authentication. Um, so that's the second property we need of this authentication. Uh, I mentioned the first property was that you can perform these measurements on top of it. The second property is that measurements on top of the, that's, I guess that's more of the, um, what this authentication achieves is that if the verifier attempts to perform a measurement that's not the measurement that it's supposed to perform, then when it sends the outcomes to the prover, the prover is going to determine that the wrong measurement has been performed. Uh, think about it as inserting traps in this. Uh, you, this authentication uses traps, and but then it's encrypted, and so if the verifier performs a arbitrary measurement, it's going to hit the traps, and the prover is going to detect that and refuse to decode the outcomes that the verifier obtains. Yeah. Uh, is it clear that, that what you're proving in three is that just an empty statement? Um, is that a special property of the encryption scheme? Why would it not be an empty statement? Well, because it's about some, you know, it's, it's a. Uh, it's about a quantum process, right? So oh, no, uh, no, 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 it, right. Maybe I, I didn't write it very clearly, but no, no. So these, out, these outcomes, if, if you have all the classical information at this point, you can classically verify that the statement holds. Okay. So you have the outcomes, you have the keys, you decode the outcomes to a certain value, you interpret that value as the outcome of a measurement on the quantum state, and you check if it's the outcome that you expected. So it's, it's entirely classical, so it is. It is. So you reduce the, cl the quantum classical? To the classical, universe. yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have five minutes. Um, I mean, the last step, maybe, um, maybe I'll just do some of it. Uh, um, okay, I'll do it sort of orally. Um, so at this point, what we've achieved or what they have achieved in their work is a quantum uh, protocol that uses a quantum verifier and a quantum prover that allows uh, the quantum verifier to determine uh, that the prover holds a witness for a certain uh, language in, in QMA uh, in, in a way that is sound and that has the zero knowledge uh, property. And now what we'd want to do on top of that is remove all the quantum stuff that the verifier has to do. So um, remove the need for quantum communication and remove the need for the verifier uh, to be quantum. So let's look at where there's something quantum going on here. Um, well, the prover is quantum, obviously, it's preparing this eigenstate, so all this, but that's the prover doing it. But it's um, that step, right? When the prover sends uh, these authenticated qubits to the prover. And then the only thing that the prover does about the authenticated qubits is that uh, it measures them, and then immediately afterwards it returns the outcomes to the prover. So what we need um, is a commitment scheme that would have the following properties. Uh, we need the commitment to be, in a sense, to a quantum state, but we'd like it to be using classical information alone so that it can be given to the verifier. And then it should be the case that given the commitment, if the verifier later is interested in obtaining measurement outcomes for a specific measurement that it cares about on the quantum state that it was committed to, it's able to do that using a classical interaction with the prover in a way that the prover is uh, bound, committed to reporting measurement outcomes associated with the state that it has committed to and with the measurements that the verifier is asking without being able to change its mind about either of them. If we had such a thing, we'd just plug it in and sort of be uh, almost done. So this is what uh, is behind the Mahadev protocol for verification that I mentioned earlier. So let me tell you what is a classical commitment scheme to quantum states uh, on that slide. And then it'll be sort of straightforward that we can plug it into the previous protocol, uh, maybe. So the scheme has the following properties. It basically achieves uh, what I described earlier. So it's a scheme between classical verifier and a quantum prover. The quantum prover has a quantum state. And so um, the scheme is going to work as follows. First of all, there's some public, pr public parameters. So this, this scheme is going to be based on the hardness of the learning of various problems. So you need to sort of instantiate this learning of various problem and tell the prover about it. Given the public uh, parameters, the prover has the ability to perform a certain quantum operation on its quantum state that results in two things. One is another quantum state that is sort of the quantum part of the commitment. 
And then the classical string, that's the classical part of the commitment. Because our verifier is classical, the prover can only send the classical part of the commitment back to the prover. So that's the commitment phase. And then, now, um, it's kind of interesting to try to define what's a commitment to quantum states when you can't send the quantum state over. Um, so instead, now there's going to be two options for the verifier. Uh, the verifier is going to uh, have the possibility of selecting a measurement that it's interested in. And in quantum computation, basically, there's only two measurements that you need to care about. They're called the X measurement and the Z measurement. It doesn't matter uh, if you don't know what they are. They're just two sufficiently incompatible measurements that all the richness of uh, quantum computing is captured by these two measurements. So what her protocol allows the verifier to do is to request outcomes according to one of these two measurements. So either an X measurement, at which point the prover can perform a certain measurement on the quantum part of the commitment, send back classical information, which are just these outcomes, such that the verifier can, given the value of the commitment and the response, decode these in order to obtain uh, outcomes of making the X measurement directly on the quantum state. And then you have a exactly analogous thing where the verifier could request measurements in the, in the Z basis. And so what she shows is that the, uh, it is possible to instantiate this uh, scheme like this based on the, on the learning of errors um, problem. So, mm -hmm. so, I have a basic question. I'm missing something. So, before, we used to have this uh, multi-prover scheme, right? In which you have a, a classical verifier interaction. Oh, mm -hmm. But as you correctly say, the difficulty is how do you know that these uh, two provers are separated? In particular, they're separated with the quantum stuff. Uh, right, which is they're right. just separated. So, uh, they're just separated. They have an entanglement, but they're separated. What you need to check is that they're just like basically space time separate. Okay, but even <coughs> check separation is hard. Yes. Okay. So therefore you say, I want to reduce it now that there is a, a classical guy verifier and there is a single prover. So there is no issue of separation, but you do, do, you do this. But the point is that if I, why can't I as a malicious verifier perform a joint measurement on everything you do and not gain some information. So I can hear by following this instruction, say do this measurement and you return that you've done this measurement and no others and things are possible. But why can't I, so you give me this, uh, like in this, uh, this uh, three states and, I, and somehow I, I zap it, whatever that means, I do some strange measurements directly on what you prefer. Whose eye is it the verifier or the prover? So here there's no quantum communication, so there's nothing to make any measurement on. But You're talking about that scheme specifically? Or? Enforceable? So in other words. Oh. Mm -hmm. So. No, so here the only thing that could go wrong is if the verifier can definitely have a quantum computer, of course. Yes. But then the only thing it could do is use that quantum computer in order to break, say, the learning virus problem. And that would defeat the protocol. I don't think there's anything else it could do. It could, it could attempt to send quantum states to the prover, but if the prover is being honest, it, there's a way that the prover can always immediately measure the quantum states that it receives and treats them as classical information. Okay, perhaps one more time, and then I'll raise So, you prepare some qubits, say three qubits. So, you is the verifier? You, you are the prover, right? Ah, so now it's the prover. Okay, okay. Okay, so then I interact with you in a pre specified manner, but what if? Why can't I do directly some quantum measurements on your triplets or qubits in the way you prepare them? Rather than asking you anything and you... So well, you, you could if... if, if question, like the question before, that, that in the world there's this quantum bits and it can't be measured because it's in the world somewhere. I'm having trouble because you use he for different entities and I'm, I'm not... So you use he for different entities and so I'm having trouble exactly um, understanding your objection. So, if you're talking about the verifier and you're saying, why can't the verifier measure the prover's qubits directly? Um, yes. I mean, these qubits are in the possession of the prover. So okay, but, they, okay, so, but uh, they are in your possession, but uh, as Chaffee says, they live in the world, even they no, are- No, no, so I think that's a basic misunderstanding. I mean, okay. it's like the, you could tell me the three coloring protocol is not sound because what if the verifier goes sort of inside the prover's mind and looks at all the colors that it must have prepared in order to create these no, commitments. The classical thing we do a lot of assumption about separation. But what I'm saying is that that isn't the case of uh, the No, I mean the assumption is exactly the same, that the prover has a physical space that's its own physical space. And of course the prover and the verifier have separate the verifier cannot make experiments in your space. Well yes. Okay. yes. 
Okay, sorry if this was implicit. I mean, I think the same assumption is made in any yeah, yeah, cryptographic yeah, yeah. protocol. It's, okay. Okay. Yeah. it's not a stronger assumption. These quantum systems cannot be, um, you know, observed any better than classical systems by not being there in the lab. So if I have a fridge, and you know, there's a dog in front of the fridge or something, then that's that's just it's just as safe. A dog. Um, well, whatever, like something that guards the fridge, a grad student, sorry. So. <laughs> okay, so thanks, Silvio. So in, I, I really hate to be taking over lunch, so I'm going to, um, the, the, the next step is to plug this back in the, pre the protocol from the previous slide and obtain the classical protocol. There, there's a few hurdles that you need to um, overcome to put the pieces together, but I'll skip that and just um, uh, directly conclude, maybe if I just have one minute for the conclusion. Um, oh, sorry, this is... No, no, no. Uh, well, okay. Uh, let's have one minute for the. Okay. So, what was the point of the talk, right? So, I started off by saying, well, um, you know, we have we're at this interesting moment in time. I think truly, um, where quantum machines are being built, and we don't exactly know what these machines do, right? Because they're very hard to test, very hard to verify, because of two things: exponential scaling and the fact that quantum information um, is difficult to observe directly. You make a measurement, the information gets uh, destroyed. Yet the things are being built and they're there on the cloud and you can play with them. And so an interesting question to determine what are going to be the modes of interaction with these, uh, with these machines. Um, so the result that I, that I presented is a zero knowledge protocol where the verifier is entirely classical, uh, has computational soundness and it applies to any language that's in our QMA, so the quantum version of uh, anything. So some questions there. So maybe the blindness question I should uh, set aside um, because it, I think you're right actually that it's interesting what happens if you combine uh, the two of them. Um, another question is what are applications for these kinds of protocols? Um, one thing that uh, zero knowledge proofs are used for uh, classically is for grading uh, schemes that have CPA security to CCA security. It's interesting whether that could be used uh, for schemes that are quantum encryption schemes and trying to get CCA security in the quantum case. It's actually very delicate to define CCA the CCA security game uh, in the quantum case, but I think it's an interesting question. There's also questions you can ask about uh, proofs of knowledge. Um, interesting feature of the protocol that I didn't get enough into to show you is that the in order for the prover to succeed uh, in the demonstration that it has the witness, it needs to perform measurements on this witness, and these measurements are in general destructive. That's a consequence of this quantum commitment protocol. So in order to succeed in the protocol, you need many copies uh, of the quantum witness, and you're going to destroy them. I think it's an open question whether you could design a protocol that has classical communication such that the protocol does not destroy the witness. Um, um, okay, then there's more practical questions, but these are... Um, Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here. Sorry for being here.